It's great. I actually liked it better than Hawaii. What was the difference? I think just because it was so easy, honestly. And it's beautiful. beautiful. Everybody speaks English. Yeah. Even, the, even the cab driver spoke English. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, good. It's a really cool city. It's a lot more modern than I thought it was going to be. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an awesome vacation. <laughs> MexicoTaxiProject.com Dixon's masterpieces are like glass paintings, transformed by the mystery of light. It's no accident that they have used leaded glass and stained glass in cathedrals for a thousand years. The idea of bringing something into a space like that raises your spirit. But glass was not the first love of this Detroit, Michigan artist. My first recollection is really around four years old. I would scribble just lines on paper, and I started seeing images in the scribbles. He became a painter and studied at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. After graduation, he became a silversmith, creating mostly jewelry. Then about 12 years ago, like many artists, John Dixon found inspiration while studying the metal and glass artistry of renowned architect and designer Frank Lloyd Wright. The designs of Frank Lloyd Wright were just so rich and so organic, part of nature, part of the hillside, part of the stream. Although John had not worked in leaded glass before, he decided to give it a try and develop his own artistic style. Today, John is executing a design for a light fixture that will almost fill the entire ceiling of an elegant study. The whole ceiling is seven and a half feet by 11 feet. I like to think of it as being like a large Tiffany lamp. He cuts the pattern for a panel featuring oak leaf clusters. Then assistant Donna Palumbit arranges the leaves on a sheet of mottled green, red, and orange Tiffany reproduction glass. She's holding up the light to see where the best spatial quality of the glass is and where the best light transmission is. Later, when the light comes through, the red will become dominant. John charges into the glass cutting process with a sense of abandon. As he rapidly cuts leaves, Donna steps in to help grind away the excess glass. John has chosen ivory-colored glass to provide a backdrop for the showy oak leaf clusters. I tend to set up the, the palette for the glass the way a painter would, where I'm establishing a very dark value, a light value, and then whatever the intense or, or star of the show glass that I'm trying to use. John builds his leaded glass on the so-called easy side, meaning the glass and the lead are cut slightly small, so he doesn't have to worry that the pattern will grow outside the lines. He must keep his eye on the size throughout the process. It's similar to a game like backgammon or chess, in a sense, because you have to kind of anticipate what your second move and your third move down the road is going to be. Otherwise, you could build yourself into a tight area and not be able to fit the glass into the channel. John incorporates faceted jewels of black glass into the leaded panel. Even though they're opaque, the black jewels will accentuate the effects of light. Because the light doesn't come through, and the light does come through, the ivory glass, it causes the, the ivory glass to really, really pop. Nine months later, four matching oak leaf panels surround the ceiling's crowning glory, a globe filled with about 2,000 pieces of glass. Light transforms it all into warm romance, filling the study with an amber glow. The idea really is warmth endearing uh, the space to the family that lives there. 
Although this glass ceiling is John Dixon's own design, it has the appeal of an antique, as if it's been a part of this home for a hundred years. And its sheer elegance will be cherished for at least another hundred years.